It's a very striking feature, I think, of Kant's philosophy, that although he conducted his philosophy impeccably in accordance with the criteria of philosophy, mm. he didn't call on faith or revelation no. or anything of that kind, but relied purely on argument and was working, as it were, entirely from within the central tradition of Western philosophy, yes. through predecessors like Locke and Hume and Leibniz and so on. Nevertheless, he does arrive at conclusions which are strikingly um, uh, capable of cohabiting with religious belief. Well, yes, except for the uncomfortable fact, which we mentioned earlier, that um, he has to say that, strictly speaking, all discourse on those topics is unintelligible to us. We don't really know what we mean. Yes. And that's a proposition that theologians have been a bit chary of accepting. <laughs> they might, might even say that nowadays more and more are accepted. Well, that may be true. Yes. Be true. Yes. yes. Another uh, difficulty about reading Kant is, is simply the prose style. I mean, there mm. are philosophers, uh, Hume is one, Plato is another, Schopenhauer is another, who are beautiful writers and a pleasure to read. But Kant's best friend couldn't say that about him. It's, yes. it's opaque, it's difficult, it's obscure. Yes. Why did he write so badly? I think there are perhaps three things one might say. I think partly um, it's uh, due to the fact which you mentioned right at the beginning, that he was by profession, and very single-mindedly by profession, an academic. And he does write in a very heavily academic style, with a great taste for technical terminology and jargon and, um, oh, what he called architectonic. It is all very academic. Um, but another important point, I think, to remember about the critiques, and this again connects with something you said at the beginning, uh, was that um, by the time he was seriously launched on writing what he knew to be his sort of master works, he hoped would be his master works, he was nearly 60, and he was actually dogged by the thought that he might die before he'd got it all down. And there's no doubt that those hundreds of pages uh, between the ages of 16 and 60 and 70 were written extremely fast. He was just writing in a hurry. And I think that has... A of course, 200 years ago, the expectation of life simply was very much shorter yes. than now, and it was perfectly reasonable to, mm. to think that he might die quite yes. soon, Yes, so that he was writing in a hurry. Another point that, a slightly less obvious one, is that um, he was, and still by that date, somewhat unusually, writing in German. Uh, which had, at that date, barely become accepted as a sort of decent language for academic and uh, learned use. Um, I Leibniz, I don't believe Leibniz ever wrote German. It was all either French or Latin. Either French or Latin, yes. 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 And um, there just wasn't a sort of established style of academic, learned German prose for Kant to adopt, and as, for example, for Bach and Hume there was. I mean, English had become a well-established uh, language for that kind of learned use. And I think that may have been a problem to him. He had no sort of models. It's a great sadness, I think, because it, it's, it's a huge, unnecessary obstacle. Yes. To understanding the work of somebody who, after all, yes, it is. is an yes. almost incomparable thinker. Yes. I said at the very beginning of this discussion that he's been regarded for generations by large numbers of uh, professional philosophers mm -hmm. as the greatest philosopher since the ancient Greeks. Why is his reputation at quite that pinnacle? I think that there were, I think I would mention uh, two qualities as entitling him to his pinnacle of fame. I think he was quite exceptionally penetrating in, in the sense that he was able to see an intellectual problem in something which had previously been taken for granted and was not worth much attention. Um, he was able to see where the problems were. Um, and I think and that's one of the greatest philosophical gifts, to be able to see that there is a problem where everybody else is going on quite happily without thinking about it much. Um, 
Then I think the other thing, and this connects perhaps with his academic professionalism, um, he was extremely good at seeing how, how it all fitted together and how what he'd said on this topic might reap a cuss, so to speak, on what he'd said somewhere else. And he was very self-conscious about it and professionally methodical in this sort of way. He does, I must say, uh, to me, make writers like, say, Locke and Barclay, and indeed Hume, excellent though they are, look rather like amateurs. <laughs> Thank um, you very much, Sir Geoffrey. Mm. Mm. <laughs>